Hello, 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 hello. Welcome. Greetings. Please, please come on in. We're going to have a good time. All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the many organizations that have collaborated to bring you this event, The Power of One, How One Person Can Spark the Flame and Unite a Movement. Uh, we believe that the urgency of this time calls all of us to step forward, and we think it's important for you to know how African Americans suffered tragedy. We've been going through some troubling times, folks. The country and the world are facing this historic crisis. Every one of us has been affected by COVID. And some of us may feel like we can't go any further and things have gotten really bad. But let me tell you this. Always in our history, bright moments come where people who are regular individuals step forward. And we are, even though we are facing perilous times and the country is in the middle of an unprecedented impeachment trial following the storming of the U.S. Capitol by white supremacist groups, there is hope. Unlike ever before, multiracial um, movements have ro risen to increase the demand for equity. Our history is filled with the struggles of African-Americans who have risked everything, their life and everything else to stand up and demand equity, to stand up and fight white supremacist violence, intimidation, policies, and laws. All of us need to know our history and be empowered to stand up and be counted. Black history, is American history. And we will discuss today the role of ordinary individuals who step forward and ignite movements that change history. It is important for you to understand the power of your voice and that your voice counts. Most movements are fueled by young people, just like you, who see injustice and decide to be a catalyst for change. People who do not know their history are doomed to repeat it. Could we talk about the members, Dr. Kalfani? Yes, wonderful. Uh, once again, thank you for uh, having us here. Uh, let me just uh, give a, a brief introduction to what the Social Justice Council is all about and, and, um, and kind of why we got started uh, just addressing issues related to uh, uh, the challenges going on in our world, uh, looking at during the time that um, Trump was president uh, and the times that some of the things going on in our community. Um, this is, I'm gonna read to you our mission statement so that you're clear on what it is that we're about uh, and what, what this, uh, I'm the chair of this body and that we are a collective of, of, of a diverse group of people and um, departments and, and, and entities here on campus. So <clears throat> the, uh, Essex County College envisions social justice as a declaration of dignity and humanity, where basic human, social, political, and economic rights of all people are valued and institutionalized. We see these rights as paramount to the principles of equity and justice. The college embraces a transparent culture where social justice is practiced. We serve with integrity and truthfulness as a catalyst to improve the quality of lives in our community. Furthermore, we strive to be a model for social justice practice for other institutions and a force for change in our society. This is the framework under which the college is committed to social justice. Now, there also is a organizational function for the Social Justice Council. And I want you to just kind of uh, listen to what that is and, 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 and think about that the things that we're doing, right? These conversations that we're having, this is the second one of four, uh, uh, but these conversations that we're having fit within the context of the function of the Social Justice Council. So we say, we say the Social Justice Council leads Essex County College's efforts as the standard bearer in the college and the community to implement social justice programs, policies, and activities that ensure 
the value and essence of social justice is integrated into the fabric of the college's operations. Uh, Dr. Carter is gonna talk about that more. Uh, the council studies root causes of inhumanity and in inequity and develops pioneering solutions through innovative proactive measures. That's proactive. That means that we're moving forward. We're not waiting for things, uh, reactionary things to happen. We're taking steps in advance. Proactive measures, education and community engagement. This is accomplished through holistic and systemic efforts. One, to implement social justice platform discussed above. Two, to work collaboratively with internal and external constituencies. So that means that for us, this is not just an initiative for Essex County College on campus, but how we interact with the community. To serve as a forum for discussion, that's what these chats are. To ensure access to resources for all students, staff, and faculty. To ensure that the entire budgeting and finance, financial processes include our values within a social justice framework. Uh, Professor Carter is gonna talk about that some more. It's, it's, this is a very important thing about how we spend our money, that is the college's money. And lastly, to deliver student services in the spirit of students first and social justice. So we want to, that's why we have the surveys and things that we have uh, so that we ensure that the things that we try to do and we talk about students first, we wanna be about students first. And so when we uh, fall short on that, we ask you all to help us uh, in this process and to uh, guide us. And uh, we don't claim to be perfect, uh, but we, we claim to struggle to strive to adhere to that which I just read to you. And I encourage you all, uh, students, staff, community, uh, faculty, um, uh, all different levels within the, in, the, in the college to let us know when we fail or when a, a, a particular aspect of us fails and that we are going to do our best to try to attend to those issues so that we get back on path. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Carter. Hi, everyone. Good morning. We're all ready to run around the block, run around the college. So I'm happy to be here and I hope you are too. Um, I'm going to talk about what social justice is. Social justice, I've heard, and I thought this was the best example, is what love looks like in public. It is not only an affront to white supremacy, which is defined and, uh, defined and an illusion of a white race being superior to all others, but should dominate and have dominion and control at the exclusion of all other human beings. It is also used as an organizing tool against the interests of everyone. Um, the contrary to popular belief, I'm sorry, I'm trying to look at my hand right now. Contrary to popular belief, it impacts the dynamics of all our interactions, whether we're black, white, uh, Mexican, it doesn't matter. It impacts all our inter interactions in a system that values money over people. Uh, all of us play a role in perpetuating, fostering, and encouraging white supremacy in our thoughts, words, actions, deeds, behaviors, conduct towards one another, unknowingly and knowingly, during our daily, as we make our daily decisions or engage in our daily decisions. Social justice is a method, a way of confronting white supremacy which may be exhibited at an institution or a college in many ways. It may be demonstrated, uh, as Akil had mentioned before, in the terms of the selection process, in terms of how vendors or what vendors will be selected for to supply the college. It could be demonstrated in terms of who selected as outside counsel uh, and professional, uh, I'm sorry, consulting contracts. It can be manifested in determining who's hired and what salaries individuals get. It can be de demonstrated by who campus police stops. Uh, it can be demonstrated by suing the college and not taking in consideration that it's gonna impact the students. It, is, it can be manifested between the relationships between administration and faculty, chairs and faculty, directors and staff, faculty to students, students to students. It's also about the decisions, practices and policies that we engage in about the direction of college. It's about how we value and respect each other as human beings. It's about us having a we attitude and not a me attitude. So that's basically what social justice is. And I wanted to make sure that I highlighted how those decisions 
are made not only by white people, but those decisions that impact us all that are in the system and incorporated in the system of white supremacy, we all participate in. So we need to be mindful of that. And the purpose of the council is to make sure that as we're making these decisions that impact the entire college in all different ways, that we recognize that those decisions are sometimes cloaked unknowingly or knowingly in a system of white supremacy. Thank you. Dr. Um, Penderhughes, talk to us about the power of one, please. So today we explore the importance of an individual action for, in the struggle for social justice. Certainly all decisions in any group are at least partly the product of lots of individual decisions. But individuals should also take initiative to start something much larger than themselves. How? By realizing that you can do anything if you break it down into small enough steps, by deciding to follow your conscience when something seems utterly wrong, yet analyzing, not simply acting on with pure emotion, but analyzing what is needed by accepting fear when you feel it, recognizing that it is our fear of fear that we must fight. When we choose to commit our hearts while driving with our minds, we open the possibilities for innovative success. And we often don't know history is at hand. Even as we know that a particular situation may be a personal landmark or it may just be a, a clear time for our commitment to values. I'm stating these observations based on watersheds in my life. For example, I'm proud to have played a pivotal role as Lieutenant of Information in the defense of death penalty charges against the national chairman of the Black Panther Party, Bobby Steele, and the entire New Haven chapter of the party in 1969 to 70. I produced literature that helped the reconstituted chapter turn the tide in the community prior to the trial that ended in a hung jury, which the government elected not to retry. What prepared me for this? My parents' lessons about being clear what is right. My experience working on my church's high school youth newsletter, running a mimeograph machine. That's uh, an ancient printer from the 1960s, but which most Panthers hadn't used before they joined the organization. Knowing what I was doing gave me confidence. So as a guy who has for decades called himself a recovering shy person, I experimented with what I knew, learned more, and was able to repeatedly make innovative steps to producing professional level propaganda. One otherwise reputable history of the Panthers claimed I was a journalist before I joined the party. Actually, I worked for a year after high school and then dropped out of college in my junior year. Then it was hired by a now PBS station in Boston as a studio crew trainee. But the racists in charge didn't train me even as a trainee, but kept me on probation because I hadn't learned a skill. So I trained myself to run Sound Boom, worked off the probation, and then quit and joined the Black Panther Party full time. My point is, you don't have to be an extraordinary individual to do significant things. You do need commitment, initiatives, and willingness to solve problems. History may determine what role you played, but as long as you are comfortable expressing your values, even in your unusual situations, your best is enough. We Panthers didn't achieve our goal of sweeping societal transformation, but the Panthers I know are very proud of our attempts to do so. Thank you, Dr. Penderhughes. Um, Ms. Forge? Yes, yes, thank you, Dr. Penderhughes, who spoke about the power of one, how one person can spark the flame and unite a movement. Now, if you can see here on the screen, we have Carter G. Woodson, a distinguished author, editor, publisher, and historian, known as the father of black history. He reached out to schools and the general public through the establishment of several key organizations and founded the Negro History Week which was the precursor to Black History Month. And I have two quotes. The first one here is, those who have no record of what their forebearers have accomplished lose the inspiration which comes from the teaching of biography and history. 
Another key quote is, if you can control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. When you determine what a man shall think, you do not have to concern yourself about what he will do. If you make a man feel that he is inferior, you do not have to compel him to accept an inferior status, for he will seek it himself. If you make a man think that he is justly an outcast, you do not have to order him to the back door. He will go without being told. And if there is no back door, his very nature will demand one. Thank you, Carter G. Wood. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Horge. I, I wanted to, uh, I think that's a great lead into what we're talking about. And that is um, shortly after the slaves were freed, there was intimidation, violence, by white supremacists who decided they were going to control the uh, the the, the, uh, the those who had just been freed um, from nineteen from eighteen eighty two to nineteen fifty there were three thousand four hundred and forty six African Americans who were lynched in the in 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 our country and the intimidation that they used to hold black people down, to make them doubt their rights and their reason for being um, was monumental during um, this time. And so what happened was you would be subject to the whims of anybody who was white as an African-American. Um, most of you've heard the story of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was falsely accused by a white woman. And ultimately she, she admitted on her deathbed that she had never, um, that he had never disrespected her, but she was falsely accused. He was falsely accused. And as a result of that, he was killed for being social with a white woman. And in 19, August of 1955, Mamie Till was faced with the tragic loss of her son. And she decided that she was going to leave the coffin open because she said, I want everybody to see what they did to my boy. And when she talks about her decision to leave the coffin open, she says, two months ago, I had a nice apartment in Chicago. I had a good job, I had a son. When something happened to the Negroes in the South, I said, that's their business, not mine. Now I know how wrong I was. The murder of my son has shown me that what happens to any of us anywhere in the world had better be the business of all of us. And after his death, Mamie went on to uh, be a advocate for civil rights and to be a public school teacher in Chicago. I think it's really important to understand how important that moment was in telling people it is time for us to stand up and be counted. That decision sparked um, the civil rights movement and many of the things that happened after it can be traced to people re watching that, seeing that, seeing those images and deciding that enough was enough. Now, I ask you a question, who am I? I refuse to give up my seat on a Birmingham bus. Who am I? Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, that's what everyone says, but really, there was oh, a, it was the pregnant lady. I'm sorry. Th there you go. Um, before Rosa Parks, uh, Claudette Colvin was a 15 year old who said, I'm not getting up. Linda, um, Dr. Carter wants to talk about this, uh, strate uh, the strategic nature of Rosa Parks' decision. Dr. Carter. Okay. Well, in our in our history across the, the scope 
people give a neuter, provide a neuter perspective and perception of many of our heroes. And so particularly with Rosa Parks, basically a lot of people don't know that it was a very strategic and tactical move to select her and also to move and engage in this kind of behavior, having her sit on a bus and not move. It didn't happen overnight. It took meticulous planning and thought in order to come up with this idea. It also took smart and disciplined people. Um, from the job that she worked to what she looked like was really important, particularly because they were looking at the optics. They were looking at how America and how the world was gonna look at this situation. Um, so I think it's important that people know that. And so the difference between Ms. Colvin and, and, and Ms. Parks is that Ms. Colvin took it on herself with the ancestors and Ms. Uh, Park, uh, Rosa Parks, she actually took it on in a strategic plan to make it happen. But either way, it still sparks other individuals to come forth and make things happen. So um, I, I just want you to, I, I'm putting in the chat um, a, a TED talk about the real Rosa Parks. And I wanted you to realize that there are a lot of times people can stand up and take a stand, but victories in movements do not necessarily mean that the movements will be successful. And so it's important to understand how to build on victories for, you, for us to have uh, real change. Uh, Dr. Pender Hughes, would you wanna to talk to us about the Panthers? Uh Yes, let me screen share, oops. First of all, uh, I want to all, whenever I do a presentation on the Black, Pan Black Panther Party formally, uh, I always dedicate it to the people who have sacrificed in the Black liberation struggle. Uh, those who've lost their, lost their lives in the struggle, but also those who are, were incarcerated or even are in prison right now, um, who uh, paid a, a heavy price uh, to, to continue this battle. Uh, oh, my goodness, a little bit too big, isn't it? Um, well, uh, the Black Panther Party was initiated by two individuals committed to bold action, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. They embraced the, the Black Power Movement with their commitment to defend the black community and transform it with revolutionary socialism. In the words of Chicago chapter deputy chairman, Fred Hampton, we're so proletarian revolutionary intoxicated that we cannot be astronomically intimidated. Our confrontations with police were highly distorted and been, have been the fuel for critics who have claimed we were terrorists. But we didn't attack the police, we defended ourselves. We didn't assassinate our enemies, we were their targets. But while we did not achieve socialism, we left a pretty interesting legacy behind. Our newspaper, The Black Panther, was a major tool in educating people in and outside the Black community about where we stood. Emery Douglas, the graphic artist who gave the Black Panther paper a unique flavor, still tours with his revolutionary art internationally. Uh, we also conducted political education with our weekly newspaper running the 10 point platform and program in every issue. These demands are unmet to this day such as point seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. The party started out as the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense with armed patrols of police after the California gun control was enacted with the blessing of the NRA, by the way, the Panthers initiated people's programs such as the free breakfast for children, um, which was later copied by the US government in their free breakfast and lunch programs for school kids. The Panthers opened up uh, liberation, also opened up liberation schools and <clears throat> operated food giveaways, free busing for prisons, for, excuse me, free busing for prisoners, families and free medical clinics with the first grassroots sickle cells testing among many free programs. And we, while we viewed ourselves as a national liberation movement that was inside the USA, um, all that while we 
viewed ourselves as the national movement inside the USA. We embraced the slogan, serve the people, body and soul. Because of our revolutionary politics, our most distinctive organizers were imprisoned or murdered like Fred Hampton. Right now, a movie about Chairman Fred's assassination by the FBI and the Chicago police, Judas and the Black Messiah, is playing in theaters and on HBO Max. Why mur murder Chairman Fred? Because he was so charismatic, he organized Chicago's youth gangs into the very first Rainbow Coalition. That Rainbow Coalition included Puerto Ricans, the Young Lords, plus Southern whites from Appalachia, the Young Patriots, along with activist Mexican Americans, the Brown Berets, Chinese Americans, the Red Guard, the white working class of rising up angry and the mostly white students for a democratic society. Before he was assassinated, Hampton had serious negotiations ongoing with the main Chicago-based gang, Blackstone Ragers, later called the Peacestone Nation. So we embraced revolutionary socialism and lived a communal lifestyle. The organizational charisma of the Panthers has rarely been matched. The Black Panther Party inspired independent Panther revolutionary organizations in Australia, the Bahamas, Canada, India, Israel, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. I would tell you much more, but there's not enough time. Instead, I'll direct you to my informational website on the party, blackpantheronline.com, where you'll find free documents and free and low cost videos about the party. Let me leave you with Chairman Fred's most widely known quote. You can jail revolutionaries, but you can't jail the revolution. You might run a liberator out of the country, but you can't lib run liberation out of the country. You might murder a freedom fighter, but you can't murder freedom fighting. Thank you so much for those um, words of wisdom. Dr. Penderhue, very good, excellent job. Um, and of course, we would be remiss if we didn't just begin to talk about the sisters who formed uh, Black Lives Matter after um, uh, the, the result of the acquittal of George Zimmerman um, for Trayvon Martin's murder. And that particular um, movement has grown um, to the point where over 16 to 26 million people participated in the George Floyd protests and they were multiracial. It's thought to be the largest social movement that we've had in the history of our country. So these young ladies got things started and we'll be talking a little bit more about um, the awakening and groups in the next uh, lecture on this series. So without further ado, I would like to introduce a Dr. Steplight Johnson, who is going to bring you um, an Essex County alum. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Steplight Johnson, the Director of Student Development and Career Services. And it is good for students when we have Essex graduates come back to share their experiences. Today we have with us Mr. Tobias Fox, who graduated from Essex County College with an Associate of Arts degree in Liberal Arts and an English Literature concentration. When Tobias was a student here, he was a member of the Phi Theta Kappa International Honor Society and a recipient of the Coca-Cola Scholarship. Tobias is an example of the power of one, how one person can spark the flame and unite a movement. Tobias, welcome back, and please share with us your story about the Occupy Wall Street movement inspiring you to make a difference. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. It's great to be on this uh, discussion and panel. I do have to give a disclaimer. I'm currently uh, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, one, we are an hour ahead, and uh, the woman who I call my mother here is urging me to come eat. <laughs> lunch <laughs> lunch is a is the most important meal of the day in the dr if no one knows uh breakfast is very light coffee tea maybe a bread 
lunch is what they live for, you know? And so she is very uh, being persistent that I come eat. But uh, also um, I'm, I'm hoping that my voice can uh, overpower some of the background noise you may or may not hear. A lot of motorbikes, I'm in the hill, in the mountains, town called Costanza, uh, and it's uh, the countryside for the most part. Uh, but I'm here, uh, I've established a nonprofit organization here called Action Global that mirrors the work that I'm doing in Newark. And so um, I wanna say that up until 2011, uh, my professional experience consisted of creative writing, book publishing, and filmmaking. It was during uh, October 2011 when I became exposed to the Occupy Wall Street movement that erupted in New York City. And so as I got involved in uh, social and environmental justice, I developed friendships with local green enthusiasts. Uh, we came together to brainstorm ideas and solutions to help improve life in our communities. And after being inspired by Occupy and becoming, and becoming a lead organizer for Occupy North, I was compelled uh, to form an organization that allows me to organize with other like-minded people. And so prior to my engagement with Occupy, with the Occupy movement, I thought protests and rallies were a thing of the past. I didn't see the importance of it, but I learned that rallies and protests are a form of social advertisement. It actually awakens the social immune system and brings alarm to our grievances. It demonstrates how we are directly affected by our environment and our capacity to influence change. My understanding of the need and hunger for solutions in my community fueled my determination to establish Newark Science and Sustainability Inc. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated that life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? With all of the events that occurred in 2020, this quote by Dr. King has become even more important to me. I honestly uh, never saw the work I do as social and environmental activism, at least not until I began to learn about food justice, the belief that healthy food access is a human right. So everyone has an inherent right to access fresh, healthy food. I also didn't know that this human right was something in many communities you actually have to fight for. It took me some time to realize that we have to alter and in many cases, completely change the way we look at things if we want the things we look at to change. Richard Buck, Mr. Fuller or Bucky Fuller, who was an American architect, systems theorist, author, designer and inventor stated that in order to change an existing paradigm, you do not struggle and try to change the problematic model. You create a new model and make the old one obsolete. That in essence is the highest service to which we are all being called. And I'll leave with a quote uh, from the late engineer, uh, structural engineer, Jacques Fresco of the Venus Project, who stated that if you think we can't change the world, it just means you're not one of those that will. Excellent, excellent job. Thank you so much. It's so great <clears throat> to come back and share your um, experiences with students. And um, I think you are just an outstanding example of the fabulous things we do at this institution and the great, great <laughs> students that we have here. You are, as, as Kelly said, awesome. Thank you Thank so you. much for, for coming and sharing that with us. Dr. Thank Carter, you. I'm going to turn it over to you because you were gonna to talk to um, um, some of our current students about um, their outlook and what makes them, um, what, what is their passion? Thank you, Dr. Davis, for the third time. <laughs> Let me just list the students this time so we all know. Alexandra, Clayton, Brandon, Burbank, George, Arquette, Joseph Rivera, Najda, and Sarah Lopes. Sarah may have to leave uh, because I know she had an appointment at 1230. But I just wanted to pose these questions to the students. And we'll start with Ms. Clayton. Do you think that one person can change the world? And if so, give us an example. And then the next thing is, do you think 
that you have the ability to change the world. Ms. Clayton? Hi. Um, so I do believe that one person can change the world. Uh, I think a good example, honestly, there's so many. Uh, what were we talking about yesterday? I'm going to say for an easy example would be the oven. One person made it and now we all use it. And that's one thing that I guess changed the world. It helped us cook easier and better. And um, yeah, so there's one. So I think I can change the world. Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet, but I totally... I'm looking forward to figuring out what I'm going to be doing to help change the world. I like to look at the butterfly effect a lot. So like one simple thing that I do can also help change a lot of things that are going on. Thank you, Ms. Clayton. You. Brandon Burbank, are you there? Brandon? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so same question. Do you think that one person can change the world and pick an example? And then do you think you have the ability to change the world and how? Well, I believe there's no question that one person can change the world, whether it be for good or for evil, a single man or woman can influence the events happening throughout the world. Perhaps a better question is, can one person save the world? And the answer is yes, and that's through Christ. Okay. And do you think you also have the ability to change the world? And if so, how? So I truly believe I can change the world for, for those who need through, de through defending the innocent and practicing righteous works of faith. And my goal is one day to defend the innocent people in the court of law by obtaining a law degree and passing the bar. And I would like to do these works through grace to make life better for my neighbors. Okay, well, we wanted to see your picture. We couldn't see your picture, Brandon. So, but you'll get a chance to respond afterwards and come and see, look how cute he is. Yes, okay. you're adorable. Isn't he adorable? Okay. The next Damn. person is George. George, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, goody. Okay. So, George, right. I don't have to repeat the question. I'm sure you've thought about it. So, uh, yes, definitely. Can everybody see me? Yes. 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 Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. As far as the questions, can one person change the world? Without a doubt. You know, we've seen countless times where. Mm -hmm. Uh, an average individual becomes, you know, a revolutionary. So it doesn't, you don't have to be born with any inherited, like, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like abilities. You don't have to be a super special person and think, okay, I have to be like the next Martin Luther King or, you know, the next Gandhi or anything. But you can even change the world through your every day-to-day -day action. You know, so sometimes we feel as though we have to, you know, uh, form protests and things of that nature, which are great, you know, but I feel as though with the day-to-day -day actions, that's the best uh, place to start, you know, if you don't have a plan for the future on how you're potentially going to change the world. And as far as can I personally change the world, I definitely know that I can change the world. And then the first way that I'm going to start by changing the world is getting more involved in our political system. You know, and then once I educate myself on our political system, then I will begin to educate my peers, my friends, and my family on that uh, political system, uh, teaching them how they can also get involved and stand up for the things that they believe in and stuff like that. And then uh, examples of people that have potentially changed the world, like we all know. Hello. Um, you know, with, you know, uh, Steve Jobs and Martin Luther King and things like that, they started with an idea and then that idea flourished and then included a community. And it, it starts with one person, but then it still takes a team in order to get the movement going, you know? So that's how I'm gonna start by changing the world. Thank you. Joseph Rivera? Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I, I certainly believe one person can change the world no matter who it is. An average person like me, your neighbor, a family member, absolutely anyone. It's all about inspiration, inspiring others. You could get out there, vote, start a movement, do whatever you want. It, it'll have a domino effect on others. 
And when you have that effect on others, it's going to multiply eventually and you could take that next step forward in whatever terms you want. And as for me, I do believe I could change the world. I don't know yet how, but I believe I feel optimistic in that the future, I could bring a sense of justice and whatever I'm involved in. And in that sense, I can inspire others to take that sense of justice and we could take the next step forward to change the world, the world we live in currently. Thank you, Joseph. Najda, are you around? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Yes, I believe that um, one person could absolutely change the world. Two of my favorite people are Henrietta Locks, who was an African-American woman who, who is the source of the oldest, most commonly used human cell line in science. And another is Dr. Eugene Lewowski, who was a Polish medical doctor who helped rescue around 8,000 Polish Jews by injecting them with um, a vaccine and basically creating like an epidemic, like how we, in are, we are in right now currently. And that caused the Germans to quarantine and they were able to save about 8,000 Polish Jews from that, you know? And then we also have a person like Robin, I mean, Robert Oppenheimer, who was the father of atomic bomb. So clearly people can change the world, you know? And I do believe that I can change the world. Um, my name means helper. So I feel like my destiny was a little predetermined for me. And my goal for me and my life is that I wanna travel the world and help rescue women and children from abusive situations and um, help end um, starvation and abuse for these people who are especially living in places that are plagued with famine. So that's my goal for my life. Okay, and the, the next person is Sarah Lopes. I think she may still be here. I know she had to leave at 1230. Sarah, are you here? Hi, I'm here. Yes, oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi, my name is Sarah. Um, so um, the question is, yes, definitely we can, each individual person can change the world. Um, each and everyone was born with, not everybody's the same. So every person can change the world in an individual way. Some people are good in talking. Some people are good in giving action. So I'm not a good talker. I'm definitely, this is not my thing. Um, so there is that one example I always think of that gave action, which is Mother Teresa. She helped the poor and she had such a big impact in so many lives. Um, to the question if I can change the world, I believe, um, I can make an impact. If I can change it, I don't know yet. Um, but I believe um, it starts with a smile. Um, a smile has such a big impact and it might not seem a lot for some people, but if I enter a store or a place and I start with a smile, everybody seems to be happy. Everybody seems to smile back. And, and um, if you can feed a hundred people, that's okay just feed one, just start with one and then just keep going. And if you can't, then you stick with one, but you helped at least one person's life. Thank you, Sarah, that was really great. I know you may not be here after the film, but that's okay, but you did a good job. Thank you so much. Okay, so what Thank we're gonna- you. Oh, Sarah, you know I love you. <laughs> she's, she's in criminal justice, we're gonna say. Um, so uh, Dr. Carter, I'm want to make sure everybody saw what we put in the chat, which was to list people you think you have changed the world. And at the end of the program, we're going to share a handout with you of some people who you may never have heard of who have um, been the spark. Uh, but right now, what we're going to do is um, launch a poll. And I'd like all the audience to answer that question. Can an individual change the world? Okay. So we are sharing the results. Can one individual change the world? 92% of you said yes. And 8% of you said no. So thank you very much.
uh, for those results. So what I was going to say is um, every single person in this um, chat, every single person on this Zoom has gotten knocked down and had to decide they were not going to stay down, but they were going to get up because it's everybody's going to feel failure. But it's not what happens to you. It's not the failures. It's what you do about them. You've seen a program of people who have taken tragedy and turned it into a revolution. And all of us have to, under, have to decide that we are going to keep moving no matter what, that we have a dream, a dream as us, and we are going to pursue that dream and we're not going to let anybody discourage us and tell us that we cannot achieve it because nobody's in charge of your destiny but you. You do not put your destiny in the hands of anybody but you. And just like he said, Spielberg, just like he was talking about all these people who were told that they couldn't cut it, Oprah is one of the most is one of the richest people in the world. Nobody can tell you what you can do. Nobody sets limits on you. You are the one who are in charge of your destiny. So I thought that that was really uh, very compelling. And um, we're going to go to Miss Horge, who's going to talk to us about some of the things that have been in the chat. Um, I have uh, all of the, the uh, links to all of the uh, videos that we um, have shared during this program, I have a handout that we're going to give out to you so that you'll be able to find this material and also additional material that you may want to look to that talks about um, other people that you may not have heard about. And um, Ms. Ms. Horge is going to talk to us about what's in the chat. And then um, we're going to bring in a special speaker who's going to tell us about African-American inventions that have revolutionized the, work, the what we do and changed humanity um, after that. Yes, thank you. Can you just uh, go back? You have a wonderful slide that talks about don't, don't, there it is, don't panic, organize. Thank you for that. I love uh, images, because this speaks to volume and speaks directly to what we're talking about. Don't panic. And you see how one person sparked a flame and united. They all come together and organize. Thank you so much. Uh, some of the comments uh, from the chat was to Tobias Fox. Thank you, everyone, saying awesome, very inspiring words. Thank you for sharing your talent and passion with us. Uh, there's some things that else was wonderful points from our Essex County College students who articulated themselves so wonderfully and had great points. Some of those points they put it out was about the domino effect or the butterfly effect. And we can all help make changes if we come together. Someone else put absolutely, I believe that one person can make a difference. And specifically, they listed. Dr. Davis, Dr. Calfani, Dr. Carter, Dr. Stepwhite Johnson, all the students who participated in the Zoom and everyone that is on the Zoom. Also, another key point was someone put a therapist. How during these times with mental illness, a therapist is someone who daily makes a difference. Others were Harriet Tubman, Nelson Mandela, George Floyd, uh, Einstein, Bill Gates. Marcus Garvey, Bob Marley, and others. So we do thank you guys for participating and engaging with us in the chat. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So now we are at the moment where we're going to talk about the inventors. Uh, Dr. Carter, can you in, can you uh, um, introduce this fabulous guest? Bam. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, hi again. I think this is my third or fourth time, but hi, everybody. Uh, the person in the corner is Vi of Vibe Service. She was in, when I met her at Weekway Park, and she had her cart with all these demonstrations of different uh, uh, inventions that were created by people in many instances to make their jobs 
while they were chattel slaves easier. But there were other inventions that were made later on. And actually today, many of us couldn't even do without this. So now Vi is located in South Carolina and I touched base with her recently and then you know all this rolled out, but I'm just happy she was able to join us. So Vi, introduce yourself. How did you decide to do this? We have about, you know, we don't have a long time, but we have enough time to make it worth your while and for the audience to get some information from you and they may want to be in touch with you later on. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Hello, everybody. How is everybody? My name is Viola Sanders, and I have a company called Vice Services Incorporation, and it was developed in order to share information because as we know, Black history can be told in many ways. A historian would write books, a musician would play and sing, and an artist would draw and paint, and a writer would create novels and poetry. But Vi's service had created a traveling mobile exhibit where I can share African-American history and culture year round. And one of those types of a traveling exhibit is your African-American inventors and their inventions. I have seven exhibits and the inventors is just one of them. You know, many of our black inventors have not been known because of slavery and not being considered a citizen. But as you know, patent is official document that confirms the right or privilege to make use or sell his or her inventions. You will see on your screen many, many items that have been been invented by African Americans, but many of them was unknown because they did not give them credit. But I will share with you all of these inventors that I have here have been granted a patent. And a patent, you know, is a official document that gives you the right to use to sell your inventions. And one of the particular things I want to note is right here in Newark, New Jersey, we have an inventor. His name was Charles B. Brooks from Newark, New Jersey. He invented the street sweeper and it was in 1890. And that was a terrific thing that can keep our streets clean. And I don't know anybody that doesn't have a cellular phone. Henry Sampson from Jackson, Mississippi invented a mechanism that's located in every cellular phone, making it possible that you and I can contact anyone no matter where we are. And that was in July, 1971, when he invented his electric cell that's in every cellular phone. There are many, many inventions that we invented. We talk about the ice cream scoop, the traffic light, Dor uh, Garrett Morgan, the rolling pin, the golf tee, even when blacks were not even playing golf, uh, Mr. Grant invented a golf tee in 1899. Also, we have uh, the refrigerator, the rolling pin, the sound of the guitar, uh, the, the uh, saddle for your horses. I can go on and on, but time would not allow me to share them all. But Blacks have made a great contribution in African-American inventors and their inventions, making all our lives easier, better, and safer. I have your traveling exhibits that I bring to you, no matter where you are, set the exhibit up and talk about these inventions. Also, I have your flashcards that you're looking at now that can be purchased. At one point, I did have the inventor's coloring books, but they are no longer being published. And Ms. Carter had asked me about it, but I no longer have those. But I have my inventor's book that has all your black inventors from A to Z, pictures of their inventions, and it's a 60 page booklet uh, that you can obtain. But one of the things I want to let you know, and in closing, is that it's important that we recognize that black people have been a part of every experience that have made and gone into building of this country. African-Americans have contributed in many, many ways as we continue to contribute. But one of the things I want to know that we have to keep our history and our culture alive. Please, if you can use my service, again, I'm Vi with the double I, Vi Services. I have a traveling exhibit with seven exhibits and seven presentations. Thank you for the opportunity of sharing our contribution, our achievements, our imagination to make all of our lives easier and better with all the African-American inventors and inventions. And this is a flashcard you're seeing here, series one and series two. Each series have 22 uh, 
boards that you can either use as a learning tool, or even if you have small children, they can turn it on the back if they want to, they can color the item. But thank you so much for the time, opportunity of sharing my service. Again, this is Ms. Vi with a double I. Love you all, be safe. All right, thank you so much. That was so great. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I also um, wanted to thank Dr. Carter for being for uh, getting Ms. Vi to come and be here because it is really great for um, us to have uh, people come and share pieces of history that we don't necessarily know about. Um, wanted to wanted to make sure everyone knew about the next a program on the 16th, that's on Tuesday, The Awakening from Personal Consciousness to Collective a Action, that's gonna be at one o'clock. The meeting code is gonna be the same. And February 23rd um, at seven o'clock, so for the evening students, we're going to have the power of the vote. That is also on a Tuesday. So I just wanted you to know about that and I wanted to bring in, um, uh, Mr. Graham, so that he can talk to you about some of the great programs Student Life is doing um, this month to also celebrate Black history. Thank you, Professor Davis, um, for the opportunity to speak about our upcoming programs. But first, I think everybody should give it up for each and every individual that worked on the committee that brought this wonderful and inspiring program to all of our students here today. Um, definitely give it up. Take a time to give it up. Clap, right? Come on, oh, animation. And, and this, um, let me, this program was sponsored by Academic Affairs, the Actor Faculty Association, Africana Institute, Criminal Justice Program, Institutional Advancement, Paralegal Studies, Social Science Division, Student Affairs, and Student Development and Career services go take it away mr graham all right wonderful so the next program that we have coming up for african american history month um through student life and activity is the art of making history with geo de reese which will be hosted next wednesday february 17th at 2 30 p.m via zoom i put the flyer in the chat the program will include talking about three historical African-American leaders and centered around their traits and characteristics that allowed them to create the history that they made so that we can inspire, encourage, and cultivate within our students the ability to leave a legacy, not only while they're at Essex, but within their community and the world at large. We also have later in the month with our very own Dr. Robert Spellman, Tuesday, February 23rd at 1 p.m. Again, this will be hosted live via Zoom. We have worked with them throughout the years to bring wonderful programming during this time of the year. I encourage everyone to turn out, attend, and support. Okay, and just as a final note, we have, um, there's a document that we uploaded in the chat that um, contains all of the information that Ms. Vi was talking about with the inventors, also the links to the uh, videos that we showed in case you wanted to go and study them some more, and as well, um, additional information about other individuals you may not have known about who would, um, who, who you could look into. And Dr. Davis, I would say that the recording will be available for people to share with friends, family, and community, uh, and to people to review at a time this convenient for them at some other time, you know, just to absorb the moment. So thank you so much for coming. We really enjoyed it. Once again, I would like to thank all the partners that worked on this, um, this uh, event, Dr. Pender Hughes, um, Ms. Horge, Dr. Steplight Johnson, um, Dr. Akil Kafani, Dr. Carter, all of these work, all of us working together, the dream, right? Dream, teamwork makes the dream work, okay? Thank you so much for your contributions. I hope you enjoyed the program and we'll see you on, on Tuesday for The Awakening. Thanks, Doc. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Great job. Thanks. Thank you.